So very common problem in the ICU is trying to ascertain fluid status. But I think that there are three big things I like to talk about when we're talking about fluid status. Um, and really I think about fluid status, fluid responsiveness, and fluid tolerance. So I'm gonna to try to hit on all three of these. First of all, when we talk about fluid status, I'm not sure what people really mean. Just, you know, the big thing to remember here is that there is an intravascular volume and an extravascular volume, right? And the extravascular volume is intracellular and interstitial, right? So most of the, the fluid and the salt and the solute in the body exists in this space. Um, and what determines the balance between the two it are three factors, right? And you probably learned about this, um, especially if you at the level of the capillary. There is a hydrostatic pressure. There is a difference in oncotic pressures. And then there is also what's called a capillary coefficient or the filtration. So when you have high capillary integrity, low hydrostatic pressure, and high oncotic pressure, you don't have issues with capillary leak. However, when we see patients in the ICU, they often have one or more of these things where you've given volume resuscitation, you've expanded the venous volume, capillary hydrostatic pressure is higher, they start to become ill uh, and they have less albumin synthesis and or albumin is extravasating. And then they also have often ca leaky capillaries for a number of reasons. They either could be uh, septic and the tight junctions between the endothelial cells is weakened or just being in a shock state for a long enough period of time, everything starts to not work. So you can think, remember that blood vessels are also end organs and the integrity of the blood vessels, the integrity of these tight junctions breaks down over time as well too. So those are the three big determinants, but when we're, you know, we, we can't, uh, some of these things we can't acutely control. We can't control uh, very largely the, the, uh, the capillary co uh, filtration coefficient, some effects maybe of norepinephrine and helping those tight junctions tighten. We can definitely manipulate the hydrostatic or intravascular volume and the pressure in the vessels. And then we can, to some degree, manipulate the um, oncotic pressure difference by giving intravenous albumin. However, recognizing that if people have really bad capillary leak, there will be some, you know, they may not, that may not be a perfect solution as well, that some of that protein will leak out into the interstitial. So those are the volume compartments. So, you know, sometimes I hear all oh, these patients extravascularly fluid overload, but they're intravascularly dry. That to me is a silly concept. You're sort of saying, I think they have a lot of extra fluid outside the vessels, but I think they'd also be fluid responsive. So what is fluid responsiveness? Well, there's a lot of different ways to try to determine fluid responsiveness. And really any type of shock you have, I guess hypovolemic being an exception where you're just really going to get volume, you, you might be wondering to yourself, well, how much bang for my buck am I going to get by putting intravenous fluids to this patient? So when you think about fluid responsiveness, you're, you're asking yourself really, when I expand intravenous volume and pressure, am I going to get a significant augmentation in my cardiac output? So over here, I've put our Frank Starling curves. On this axis, as you recall, is pressure. And on this axis will be cardiac output or stroke volume or flow. And I write flow because I'm also gonna draw another curve up here in a moment, but recognize these are several different Frank Starling curves with different levels of contractility. This might be a normal person. This might be somebody who has high adrenergic tone because they're sick with something. And then this might be somebody, uh, adrenergic tone. And this might be somebody who's got, you know, reduced right ventricular, left ventricular function at baseline. So cardiomyopathy of some sort. And when we talk about fluid responsiveness, when we use this curve, we also have to think about the venous return as well, which is a separate curve. And it can take different shapes and sizes. This x-axis point is called the mean systolic filling pressure, or some mean systemic filling pressure. It's basically the amount of tone, sorry, the amount of pressure that would be left in the venous system if there was circulatory arrest at that moment in time. A simple way to think about it is just how much fluid is in the tank and how much pressure is putting into the, uh, the vascular system by doing so. So when you give fluid boluses, you are continually scooting that venous return function along the x-axis here to new intercepts because you're providing more fluid in the tank. This is also in the influence of what uh, of the uh, sympathetic nervous system to some degree as well. Um, but then they also have this venous return. Uh, the, the slope of the line is dictated by venous uh, resistance. So when patients have lower venous resistance, they can have a higher maximal flow. But if they have, you know, uh, the venous system clamps down, it actually ends up augmenting cardiac output at the same pressure. And they get sort of this type of phenomenon where they might, uh, I try to do this somewhat poorly, but they get you know, some increase in venous return just by clamping down their, uh, their veins. So fluid responsiveness, you know, there'll be a handful of ways to measure. One of the most common ways people do this is, is somewhat empirically. So they find a patient, 
And as I said in other talks, you know, the blood pressure is not the only uh, marker of shock. You can have normal intensive shock, but just thinking about it, you know, sort of patient that comes in, you know, seen on a, a general medicine ward or something, has a blood pressure of 70s over 30s, and the, there's a low mean arterial pressure, and their heart rate, you know, says so the blood pressure, their heart rate is 110, and you say, well, you know, I think I'm just gonna give them fluid, 500 cc's of crystalline and see what happens. And if you had a change like this, and if now it's 80s over 40s, and the MAP has gone up, you know, five to 10 points, and the heart rate has come down, you might go back to your equation for MAP, being roughly cardiac output times stroke, with SVR, and heart rate and stroke volume being here, so you would probably infer, and probably rightly, that if the MAP is increased in response to this fluid bolus, that means the stroke volume has probably improved, which has caused my heart rate to come down and my blood pressure to come up. So that is sort of one of the simplest ways to do this, but we don't want to give a bunch of people fluids, especially if they already have other comorbidities that we'd worry about it, or you go examine them, you see they already have some edema, you'd say, well, why would I keep giving fluids to this person um, and just doing it all empirically? Well, a couple other things you can do at that bedside to determine fluid responsiveness. Um, are based on this, not just sort of this math, but looking at like, is cardiac output improving? And you can just look at, is the patient maintaining better after a 500 cc fluid bolus after a liter? Uh, but one of my favorite markers at the bedside, and it should be yours as well, is the capillary refill time. And this is uh, a valid way to ascertain cardiac output, particularly at extremes. If somebody's got a capillary refill time of two to three seconds in their finger pads or their nail beds or their knee caps, that patient has a high cardiac output already and it's very unlikely to be fluid responsive. If they have a really prolonged capillary refill time, you might want to get a little bit of additional data, but you say, well, that's probably somebody in a low cardiac output state, and at least we should probably try fluid uh, resuscitation, especially in the context of sepsis, because I, I, I kind of talked about in another shock talk, patients with sepsis can have loss of venous return, but also loss of SVR, and with the loss of venous return, they have loss of cardiac output, and you want to say, well, I'm going to get fluid bullets, am I going to get more cardiac output from it? And you can check at the bedside what happens with the cap capillary refill time after a 500 cc crystalline bolus and say, okay, this is probably the right strategy so far. Those are relatively crude bedside things you can do. Then there's, you know, when I, I ask people about this, I'm like, well, what about the venous pressure? Can you use the venous pressure? And a lot of people these days don't seem to be very comfortable looking at neck veins or not very confident in their skills. But the way, I've, you know, you can sort of come back to the Frank Stalin curve. You can use venous pressure in your, venous beds, uh, your, your bedside examination of, of venous pressure to help you figure out, for some patients, are they likely to be fluid responsive? So as you notice here, if I have three people all with different contractility functions, once I take them up very much with blood volume and I've shifted their venous return over here, they're all basically on the flat part of the Frank Starling curve. So if I go to the bedside and I see some of these neck veins are popping out of their head, I don't have to know anything about pump function. I would say this is a person with a high venous pressure, pressure is on this axis, high venous pressure, they're probably getting to that flat part of the Frank Starling curve no matter how strong their heart is, not likely to be fluid responsive. On the other end of the spectrum, it doesn't matter what the contractility curve is, if I go to the bedside and I can't find their neck veins and they're thin enough, got them flat and still barely see neck veins above their clavicles, these are people that are almost certainly fluid responsive, again, no matter what the pump function is. So at extremes, central venous pressure, or measure, you know, sort of just try to ascertain venous pressure from the, the jugular vein is really helpful. So like a really low CVP is almost always fluid responsive. In fact, I would say it always is. And on the other end, high CVP, that would give you rough numbers, you know, things less than two or three here, and probably like 12 plus. These are some pretty good cutoffs of, you know, roughly like these people are definitely uh, almost certainly not fluid responders, and these are probably fluid responders. So a lot of people are like really wooed by an ultrasound now these days, and they say, well, I'm not really with the neck veins, I'm gonna look at the IVC. Inferior vena cava is my marker of fluid responsiveness. Just recognize the inferior vena cava is largely operating the same way as a venous pressure. So when patients have, on this end here, an IVC that's less than two centimeters and spontaneously collapse, uh, spontaneous collapses by more than 50% th throughout the respiratory cycle, if they're not on a ventilator, that is almost certainly somebody that's going to be fluid responsive. On the other hand, you know, if, they're, if their IVC has no respiratory variation and is greater than 2.1, or you know, I start sometimes see patients with like an IVC like two and a half, three centimeters, that person almost certainly uh, is not going to be fluid responsive anymore. This implies that their venous return is maximized. You fill the tank up and you're, you put more venous volume in there, it's gonna cause just a little more stretch of the veins, but more likely it's just gonna extravasate over time, 
cause more congestion in organs. So IVC ultrasound is sort of a CVP plus. There's a little bit more physiology that goes into it, but these are some, some you know, some nice crude markers. Then of course, while you have the point of care ultrasound out, you may as well just take a quick peek at the LV and RV. You don't have to be an expert in critical care echocardiography to make some general, um, to, to gain some general impressions about the state of the RV and the LV. So if you have somebody that's doing this with an LV and RV slapping, uh, the wall slapping against each other, that's somebody that's underfilled, they're probably gonna be fluid responsive. Similarly, if their LV or RV is doing this and barely moving, um, that is probably not something that's gonna be very volume responsive. Then the ways we do this in the ICU are a little bit more sophisticated, and they are ways of trying to figure out, is cardiac output actually improving? And they are all based on the idea that the preload throughout the respiratory cycle changes. This is true if the patient's on a ventilator or if they're breathing spontaneously. There is a change in intrathoracic pressure that is changing preload throughout the respiratory cycle, and we can take advantage of that. If people um, are on the flat part of the frame starting curve and the preload is changing throughout the respiratory cycle, but there's no change in the cardiac output or stroke volume throughout that respiratory cycle, then you can, you can infer that they are on the flat part of the frame starting curve. I hope that makes sense. Audience, does that kind of make sense? Okay. <laughs> I do have an audience here. All right, so <laughs> the... Um, <laughs> the uh, so, the, so we, we have, then we have to figure out, you know, what are the ways to measure this cardiac output or stroke volume throughout the respiratory cycle? Well, one of them is to look at pulse pressure variation um, on an arterial line. Now, this, now, these other methods of assessing fluid response and this depend on invasive hemodynamics, but a pulse pressure variation would be on an arterial line looking to see, is there any change in the stroke volume? The stroke volume on an arterial line is actually just, is, a, is reflected by the area in this curve. So if throughout the respiratory cycle, the area on this curve is not changing, this patient is, has been a flat part of the frame starling curve. No matter what is happening with preload, stroke volume is unchanged. Now on the other end of the spectrum, you know, when people have significant changing intrathoracic pressure and they're on the ascending part of the frame starling curve, there is significant, as stroke volume's on the y-axis here, there is significant change in the stroke volume throughout the respiratory cycle. Is this, uh, so, I'm just gonna draw it over here because I'm not sure I'm gonna fall off the board at some point here. So the person that is fluid responsive would have significant stroke volume variation throughout the respiratory cycle and the breath. And depending, again, if they're on a ventilator or off a ventilator, there'll be differences in how you interpret this, but wide pulse pressure variation. Uh, 15, 20% is a, sort of a good marker of significant fluid responsiveness. Other ways that we have to do this are sort of more sophisticated, more sophisticated ways of building off the pulse pressure variation. We can do this with echocardiography. There are specialized uh, devices in the ICU that do this a little bit more in a more sophisticated manner. But if you have an arterial line tracing, most modern ICU monitors will give you a pulse pressure variation. And you can look at it throughout the respiratory cycle as a way to determine fluid responsiveness. Now the last part of this then is fluid tolerance, which is not exactly the same thing as fluid responsive. So a uh, you know, common population that I see that is likely fluid responsive but poorly fluid tolerant would be the patient with advanced cirrhosis. These patients, going back to our picture before about intravascular and extravascular volume, have low oncotic pressure, um, they often have ongoing capillary leak from whatever they're here with. They're here with sepsis, they just have really bad or multi-organ dysfunction, uh, ongoing inflammatory response from gut congestion, acute and chronic liver injury, whatever is driving that. Um, and, but they're also like hypotensive, they're like, okay, well, should I, should I take them up with more fluids? And you go to the bedside and you see that their LV and RV are pretty hyperdynamic. And you look at their IVC and it's, and it's kind of collapsing throughout the respiratory cycle. But then you look at their body and they're swollen everywhere. And you put your finger into the shin and you leave, you leave an indentation for 15 seconds. Well, these patients pre present a, uh, definitely present a therapeutic conundrum. Um, because on the one hand, you'd say, well, a lot of my markers would suggest this patient is fluid responsive. But then you have to think about like the downsides of this, like the fluid tolerance. If you give intravascular crystal in particular, the, the, the effect isn't very long lasting. You've probably heard the rule of thumb that about a third of crystalloid stays in the vessels and that's because about a third of your volume in your body is intravascular and the other two thirds are extravascular. So you give that intravenous crystalloid over the next four to six hours or so, and that's the, even in healthy people, that's about how long it lasts in the intravascular uh, compartment. It's just gonna leak out over time. So then, you know, fluid tolerance to me is, there's several things built in this concept. One is how congested is everything. Skin is not just the only problem, though skin doesn't matter. I have a future dermatologist in my small audience here. Um, so, you know, integrity of the skin matters, but also other organs get congested too. Intestines, liver, kidneys, 
lungs. None of these things are happy when they're full of extra vascular water. So the other part about uh, you know that people sort of look at, and it's probably beyond the scope of this with intravascular venous, uh, sorry, with, with fluid tolerance, is like, like trying to get surrogates of venous congestion from ultrasound. And that's probably a little bit beyond the scope of this as well, but that is something that a lot of intensivists will have in their armamentarium to help determine like, okay, are we really way too far past on the fluid resuscitation here that we are now having congestive features based on venous pressure being high and having you know, venous um, backflow into organs. I think I'll stop it there. Uh, this was meant to be more targeted for people starting in ICU, maybe doing their first rotation. So this is a bit about how I think about fluid status, responsiveness, and fluid tolerance. Nice.